My name is Gregor Kozalas. And what I want to talk about today is a belief I have that our field is about to go through an extremely exciting revolution. What I think we're going to do is fundamentally change the way we think about abstraction and use abstraction in the engineering of software. What I want to say is that there's a number of people in the object-oriented programming community and also in the systems community, operating systems, programming languages, networking, who are dealing with a kind of problem and building a kind of system that pushes us away from the traditional way we have of thinking about abstraction and that requires a new kind of abstraction framework. The goal of this talk is to summarize both the need for and the basic nature of this new abstraction framework. In some sense, I want to provide an initial framework that we as a community can then use for further fleshing out this new, uh, this new set of ideas about abstraction. One thing I want to stress is that the change I'm talking about here is not, a kind of, is not new problems or new systems, but rather a new way of thinking about existing problems and existing systems that I think will better support building newer systems that deal with these problems. Finally, one thing I want to say is that while I'm presenting this here by myself today, all of this work is the result of a group of us both at PARC and also in other parts of the community working on these new kinds of um, ideas of abstraction. Uh, and so I'm lucky enough to be giving the talk, but there's a number of other people who've been doing the work. Before I go on, let me give you a little sense of my own personal background, because I think that that gives some of the motivation for how I've come to this work and will help understand where it comes from as we go along. When I first started programming, it was in high school, and I was programming in BASIC on a PDP-11 in RISTIS. And in the same way as I think for many people, your first encounter with, with computers, it was fun and exciting and wonderful, and I just loved it, and I spent all hours doing it. Um, but I only did it for a couple years, and after a while, I went off to hack theater lighting instead. And I wish I could tell you that the reason I made that switch was because my fundamental sensibilities of modularity and elegance had been offended. Um, but I don't think I had any fundamental sensibilities of modularity and elegance at the time. Um, so I just went off to do it something else because it was fun. And then when I went off to college, I went to an engineering school. And when I got there, what people kept saying was that the fundamental challenge of engineering was to master the complexity of the systems we were trying to build. And I was a mechanical engineer at first, and the professors were all saying, that abstraction and decomposition were the fundamental tools that we were going to use for dealing with the complexity of these systems. And after doing a couple years of mechanical engineering, I then went off to try computer science again, just to see what it was like. And when I got in those classes, they were again talking about abstraction and decomposition and modularity. And all at once, my programs were kind of wonderful again. And and I wrote these nice things, and they were simple and elegant, and I could understand them. And I was very happy, and I decided to be a computer science major. But then I started writing some bigger programs. And sure enough, things got out of hand again, and things got more complex than I would have liked. But the place where the rubber really hit the road, in some sense, was when I started working on the project, the Common Lisp Object System Project. Now, if you believe the principles of modularity and elegance that were taught to me in school, the opportunity to work on um, the design of a high-level programming language, it's really like dying and going to heaven. Because what you're going to do is make a very high-level abstraction that your clients are going to be able to use and is going to insulate them from all the underlying details. And that's going to be great for them. But on this project, I was in a very unique position. Because not only was I part of the design of CLOS, this high-level abstraction, but I was also trying to make an implementation of it, which ran on top of Common Lisp, which was also a high-level language abstraction. And so it put me in a very interesting situation of being both the customer and provider of my own story. And in some sense, I think that's a good experience. We should all go through it sometime. Um, because here's the rub. You can write an implementation of CLOS on top of Common Lisp in about 10 pages of code, maybe 15 or 20 pages if you want the error messages to be good. But my implementation, PCL, ended up being 350 pages of code. In order for it to end up being fast, 
had to be that long. And not only that, but it cheats the whole way. Now, I don't claim that that problem is completely typical of all the kinds of problems I'm going to talk about today. But I want the kinds of answers about software complexity and about the problems we're having to do justice to that kind of problem. And what I want to say, I've already alluded to, is that I think the words and framework of black box abstraction that we've been using in the past are part of the origin of that problem. And that if we can come up with a different way of thinking and talking about systems design, we'll come up with better solutions. So that's a lot of big words. Let me try to put some meat on that now. Let's start with a simple example. Suppose that you're going to des design the display portion of a spreadsheet application. So everybody kind of knows what that would look like. You would have the spreadsheet code that would sit on top of a window system, which would sit on top of a, of a programming language, which would then sit on top of an operating system, something like this. And this functional decomposition is so typical that, in fact, what we've done in the field is to standardize many of these components. Um, the window system standardized, the programming languages are standardized, and the operating systems are standardized. Now, if we look a little more closely, what's going on with each of these, with, with each of these subcomponents is that there's a very clean interface. This thick blue line represents the clean interface, which provides functionality. And then the implementation itself is hidden inside of a black box. And the reason we hide it that way is that inside the implementation, it's a horrible and frightening thing. And what we want is to protect the clients of the Windows system from that. So we cover that up with this black box. And then they just get the nice blue interface. And what happens is, what I've done here is to show client code that uses the simple interface as very clean, simple, straight blue lines. Because that code, because it's hidden from the complexities of the window system, is very simple. That's the fundamental idea of black box abstraction. Now, an interesting thing is, I think a lot of us take this, uh, this approach to system design very much for granted. But it wasn't really always this way. In this paper here, uh, Dave Parnas says, this is a paper from 1972, and what he says is that every module is characterized, he's talking about how to decompose systems, and he says every module is characterized by its knowledge of a design decision which it hides from all others. Its interface was chosen to reveal as little as possible about its inner workings. It's hard to completely track down the origins of black box abstraction, but this paper is the, is, introduces this notion of hiding, which plays such a central role in, um, in this abstraction framework. Turning back to the window system example, what does all of this really mean for this example? Well, everybody knows what a window system looks like. There's a bunch of little boxes on the screen, and they're arranged in a matrix, and you can click in them, and you can type in them, and display text, and, and that's just what you want. And everyone also knows what kinds of functionality the window system interface provides. It provides little boxes that you can put on the screen, and you can click in them, and you can type in them. So if you're going to build a window system on top of a spreadsheet, uh, if you're going to build a spreadsheet on top of a window system, the clear way to do it is to just make yourself a thousand, 100 by 100 little windows, arrange them, arrange them in a matrix, put them up on a screen, and there you go. Now, I think when we look at this, all of us are right away suspect. But let me make a couple points about this. One is, this is black box abstraction at its finest. Because this simple blue code is simple. It is clear. We know what it's supposed to do. It's insulated from the details of the window system implementation. Another point I want to make, everybody's very hot on reuse these days. Well, this is software reuse in a very big way. Because the person who wrote this implementation of the spreadsheet is making massive reuse of the window system functionality. That's the good news. The bad news is this piece of code probably won't work. And the reason it won't work is that even though the window system interface, the thick blue line, hides the implementation, the implementation nonetheless comes shining through. And it comes shining through in the guise of the window system's performance. The question is, why is that? Well, the reason is that 
not all of the aspects of the implementation that we hid behind that interface were really details. A number of them were what I want to call mapping dilemmas. And what I mean by that is strategy questions that affect the performance of the implementation differentially depending on client patterns of use. So in this case, the implementer of the Windows system has to decide whether Windows should be a very heavyweight data structure that memoize a lot of internal values, and whether the mouse tracking should be based on a general um, sense of geometry, or whether Windows should be very lightweight data structures and mouse tracking should try to optimize for regular geometry. What happens in the Windows system case is that Windows system implementers almost always choose the first set of approaches, and that's why you can't write the spreadsheet this way. Let me say one more thing about this term mapping dilemma and why it's the term we propose using for this. In some sense, what happens when you implement a higher level functionality like the Windows system interface on top of a lower level functionality is that you take the higher level functionality and you have to map it down onto the lower level functionality. So that's this sense of mapping. And the sense of dilemma is that when you're faced with one of these strategy questions, the implementer has a dilemma. If they choose one way, some of their prospective clients will be happy. And if they choose another way, other prospective clients will be happy. But either way, they can't really quite win. I also want to right here introduce two more terms. Mapping decision is the term that I'm going to use for the decision that an implementer makes about a mapping question, about a mapping dilemma. And mapping conflict is what happens when the client of an interface, in this case the client of the Windows system interface, tries to use it, but because the implementer made a mapping decision that isn't the one the client would have preferred, their code doesn't run the way they would like. The key point here, though, is that what the tip traditional interfaces we've been building do is that they lock in, but they don't really hide mapping decisions. They just lock them in, and that can lead to mapping conflicts. Now, another thing you might say is you might say, oh, that's very interesting. Um, but that example is, um, is somewhat extreme. And there's sort of three points I want to make about that. The first point is maybe it is a little bit extreme, but the rhetoric of black box abstraction that we teach in Computer Science 101 doesn't account for this example. The second point I want to make is it sure is a shame because um, a slightly different window system would have allowed itself to be used this way. And of course, we'll see in a minute that there are some slightly win different window systems that deal with this. And the third and most important point is that I have some less extreme examples. The first of them is virtual memory. Virtual memory is actually the sort of canonical example of this kind of problem. Everyone knows what the virtual memory abstraction is. There's lots of memory. It's directly accessible. The client can allocate it and read it and write it. But that abstraction, that interface, hides some very serious mapping dilemmas, one having to do with the page replacement policy. Most implementers of virtual memory choose a least recently used, or LRU, page replacement policy, which is right for most clients of virtual memory. But there are some clients, data, uh, database applications tend to be the classic example, where LRU isn't what they want. What they want is something more like MRU, because the, what the database does is it makes random access to some of its memory while doing sequential accesses to other parts of its memory. So for the sequentially accessed memory, LRU isn't what the database application wants. And we'll come back to database programmers in just a minute. Another example is graphics applications. When you're rendering images in graphics applications, it's very important not to take a page fault at the wrong time. And the way that works is that the graphic application walks through a bunch of data structures displaying them on the screen. And if the data structures happen to be laid out in memory wrong, and the prefetching policy that the virtual memory system uses doesn't line up with what the graphics application wanted, then that can be a very serious problem. And what most graphics people do to actually solve this problem is just to buy more memory. Another category of examples is from programming languages. I think all of us are familiar with the procedure abstraction that exists in many programming languages. I've, I've used a C syntax here. Um, 
While the procedure abstraction is quite familiar, it hides a very significant mapping dilemma, which is whether procedures should be called in line or out of line. And there are many cases, very performance critical cases, in which whether the implementer has chosen to do it one way or another way can really affect whether the client can use the procedure abstraction. In, uh, in scientific computing, um, a different kind of mapping dilemma that come up has to do with arrays. We all know the abstraction of arrays, but the mapping dilemma is how the array should be laid out in memory. On a uniprocessor, there's issues of how it should be blocked. And on a parallel processor, there's issues of how the array should be distributed across the processors. And depending on how the compiler chooses to do that, it can be more or less easy for the client uh, to be able to use uh, the compiler's implementation of arrays. Now, one thing I want to stress is I don't think this is just an abstract or theoretical problem. I've given some very small examples, but I think that examples just like these lead to a great deal of the complexity in our current systems. Of those 300 pages of code bloat in my implementation of the common lisp object system, I think several hundred of them, a couple hundred of them anyways, are due exactly to these kinds of problems. What I want to do is say that the problems that come up fall into at least two basic categories. The first I call hematomas of duplication. And this happens, everybody knows what happens the way you would actually deal with the, uh, with the spreadsheet case. What you would do is you would make yourself one big window. And then in that window, you would draw a bunch of vertical lines and a bunch of horizontal lines. And you would keep track of where all the lines were. And you would keep track of where the mouse was. And that, 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 that. Well, what you would have done would be to implement your very own little window system. And that's what these hematomas are. Someone duplicated a piece of functionality that was already there. But they got it with the right performance trade-off. An example of coding between the lines is what clients of virtual memory often do. Um, so, um, so for example, in the graphics application, what they do is people rewrite their code over and over and over again until they manage to somehow get the objects to be laid out in memory in such a way that the paging system works for them. And I've drawn this with these squiggly little lines because that's kind of what happens to the neat blue code after you contort it in order for this to be able to work. Um, another classic example of how that happens in virtual memory is in garbage collection systems, where you do a great deal of contorting to somehow manage to conform to the virtual memory. Now, this, of course, is particularly a problem in systems that are designed to have multiple clients. So if you take the Windows system case again, if the window system is just being used by one kind of client, say a word processor, then it's very easy for the window system to end up being properly tuned. In other words, to have the correct mapping decisions for that client. But then what happens is another client comes along, like the spreadsheet. And the window system isn't properly tuned. It doesn't have the right mapping decisions for the spreadsheet. And so the spreadsheet ends up with a hematoma. And then another client comes along. And it's worse, and it's worse, and it's worse. The key point being that different clients want different mapping decisions. Now, multiple clients is actually just another word for reuse. What's going on here is that these people are having a hard time reusing this underlying system because of the mapping conflicts that are coming up. And I think as we're interested in reuse, we should take this very seriously. Because what we're seeing here is that it's been very hard to reuse underlying system software in performance critical situations. And one of the goals of this talk is, is again, to see if we can get a way of thinking about the design of these systems that will help us deal with this problem. As just one example of how, these, uh, of how significant these problems can be, I know from one of the major database vendors that at least 35% of their product is basically hematomas designed to deal with the various kinds of mapping conflicts and other portability issues that come up as they try to live on multiple platforms. 35% of a database product is a very big number. Um, so I think these are very serious problems. <coughs> 
Now, as I said before, I'm not the first person to have noticed some of these problems. Here's another very interesting paper uh, by Mary Shaw and Bill Wolfe from 1980 in which they point to some of these problems in the context of programming languages. Um, and one of the things they say is, traditionally, the designers and implementers of programming languages have made a number of decisions about the nature and representation of various language features that the authors feel are unnecessarily preemptive. And this notion of preemptive is it's really a, a great concept here. It's their way of saying what the effect of a mapping conflict is. Because what it does is it says that if the implementer makes one mapping decision and it isn't the one that the client needs, then the client is preempted from being able to use the service the way that they would have liked to. Um, so that's a nice term which we can also incorporate into this framework. They then go on to say that both the designer and the implementer have only notions of typical use available. They are making the decisions too soon. And this notion of the implementer making the decisions too soon is something we'll see throughout this talk and we'll come back to explicitly later. Finally, they also go on to say that although most people now agree that the use of high-level languages is desirable, the fact remains that many major systems are still written in assembly language. And that's, of course, still true today, although the syntax is worse and now it's an ANSI standard. Okay. So let me summarize what I've said so far. First off, we're engineers. And as engineers, our crucial challenge is to control the complexity of the systems that we're building. And the basic tools that we use to do that are abstraction and decomposition. In our discipline, to date, we've tried a particular abstraction framework, which is called black box abstraction, which attempts to expose functionality and hide implementation. We've run into problems with that because mapping decisions nonetheless show through. And that leads to hematomas and coding between the lines in clients of these abstractions. The fundamental problem is that the clients need control over the mapping decisions. So one way or another, we've got to find some other approach other than hiding the implementation away from the clients. The question is what to do about it. Well. Let me talk quickly through five possibilities, none of which will, of course, end up being the one I propose since they've come so early in the talk. One possibility would be to document the mapping decisions. That's not really going to work because just knowing that something isn't what you want doesn't make it be what you want. Another possibility is you could say to clients, well, here's the sources. Have fun. Figure out what's going on. And I don't think I need to elaborate very much about the relative success of that plan. Uh, or you could just give up and just say, well, this is an intractable problem. Two more solutions that are worth contra contrasting. One would be to avoid mapping dilemmas. That would mean to design systems that are so low level that their implementation presents no mapping dilemmas. A different possibility would be to pretend it isn't a problem. In other words, design systems that have the functionality you want, whether they have mapping dilemmas or not. Now, you might find that to be an odd contrast, but I think if you turn to this paper by a very famous person um, from 1974, what he says here is, this is in the context of programming languages, so it only addresses the problem in that context. But he says, in fact, I found that a large number of programs perform poorly because of the language's tendency to, quote, hide what's going on with the misguided intention of not bothering the programmer with details. This is a very nice and compelling paper. But basically, what it ends up saying is that we should design languages that are so low level that they have no mapping dilemmas in them. And this is the, the origins of a, a number of languages like C. Now, me, I was originally a Lisp guy. And when I first saw this paper, I was quite shocked by it. Because the Lisp community took the second approach. It took the pretend it isn't a problem approach. And what they did was they said, we will put into the language the right functionality and figure out a way to implement it later on. And I think the market has very clearly spoken about what choice was the right choice for the time being. Uh, 
But I'm actually not interested in that debate anymore. What I think I want to say in this talk is that given a lack of understanding of the problem of map mapping dilemmas and the lack of a clear solution to it, this approach of going low level was the right one. But maybe by the end of this talk, we'll have an idea about a better approach. And we'll have an idea about dissolving the dichotomy between the pretend it isn't a problem versus avoid the mapping dilemmas approach. So again, these aren't new problems. And in fact, there's a number of systems that have tackled them before. In the specific context of programming languages, there's these mechanisms called compiler switches or compiler pragmas or compiler declarations. And what happens, for example, in C is that there's this switch called inline that tells the compiler how to resolve the mapping dilemma about whether procedures should be inline or out of line. In high performance Fortran, there's a mechanism that allows the client programmer again to tell the compiler how to resolve the mapping dilemma about how to lay the array out in memory. Turning to the Windows system example, what a number of Windows systems have done is they introduce a similar mechanism that once again allows the client to tell the Windows system to use a different implementation of Windows, in other words, to make a different mapping decision about the Windows that would basically allow the spreadsheet programmer one quite like it to work. Now, if we analyze these solutions for a moment, what we can see is that they do address the fundamental problem of giving the client programmer control over the mapping decisions. In the case of, of procedures, the client programmer gets control over how the procedure should be implemented. In the case of arrays, the client programmer gets that control. And similarly, in the case of the windowing system. And this works quite well in some cases. It allows some kinds of hematomas and coding between the lines to be avoided in these examples. Moreover, the declarative nature of these mechanisms means that they're very, very reliable. But it also means that they're of limited power, because what's going on is that the client has to choose from among a fixed set of alternatives to control the mapping decisions. So now let me look at a different kind of solution, a solution uh, to the virtual memory problem that comes from, uh, that's based to some extent on object-oriented techniques. There's been a lot of work on this in virtual memory, starting pretty much with work on the mock external pager, which is presented in this paper by Young et al from uh, SOSP 87. And what they say here is an important component of the mock design is the use of memory objects, which allows applications to participate in decisions regarding secondary storage management and page replacement. In other words, where they say participate in decisions, I would say participate in mapping decisions. So what they're doing is letting the client in to control the mapping decisions. And as we'll see, they're using some object-oriented techniques. I'm just going to walk through this very quickly because it's the basic architecture of it and not the details that are interesting to us today. If you look at how virtual memory works, the traditional black box implementation, there's the operation of malloc and read and write. And then there's the interface. And everything's hidden in a black box implementation. And what we see here is that what's going on is that the implementation maps that interface down onto physical memory pages and actual disk drives. And if we look inside the box, the way that's working is that there's some amorphous hunk of code that implements the various operations. And then there's a data structure or a set of data structures called a page table that tells the virtual memory system for each address exactly where it is, whether it's on a given page of physical memory or whether it's out on the disk drive. Now, it actually turns out that a couple of these operations are really implemented by hardware. But that detail doesn't really matter for our discussion right now. So remember, what's the problem that these people were trying to solve? They wanted to give the client control over certain mapping decisions in virtual memory, in particular, page replacement policy and page replacement mechanism. Well, so what's the solution to that? Well, one solution would be to allow there to be multiple copies of the virtual memory kernel sitting behind the interface so that some parts of memory would be controlled by one copy of the kernel, and other parts would be controlled by another part. 
Well, that kind of solves the problem in a theoretical sense, but it's sort of a pain because it means that if a client wants a different implementation of virtual memory, they have to duplicate the entire implementation and then install it. So what they did in Mach and many of these follow-up systems is that they used object-oriented programming to modularize that a bit better. And what they did was they made each of the regions of memory be objects. And what the dotted lines here are showing, the dotted lines with arrows, are showing is that they have a well-defined protocol of virtual memory operations among those regions of memory. And then what there is in, is there's a default class of region of memory object which implements the various operations like malloc and determines which page to flush and how to load pages. And then what the client can do is if they want a new kind of region of memory, a new implementation of virtual memory, they just make a subclass, which I've shown in red, a subclass of that class. Uh, and all they have to do is recode the one operation that they want to change. So for example, in a paper from Oops Law 93, Kruger et al. showed that in a very small amount of code, which I'm not going to show in detail, you can make a new virtual memory system using their architecture which does a most recently used page replacement policy rather than a least recently used page replacement policy. And there have been some other people who've done very similar things where they, for example, in a very small amount of code, been able to change the virtual memory system to do highly compressed paging or something like that. So that's three kinds of examples of systems that provide clients with control over mapping dilemmas. Uh, in fact, there's very many others. Once you have this framework for understanding the situation, it's easy to find a bunch of them. Almost every programming language provides some kind of pragma or other mechanism for giving programmers this kind of control. Operating systems as far back as VM370, and I think in fact farther, provide clients with control over virtual memory or other kinds of issues. As I mentioned, Mach and all of the systems built on it take that a step farther. More recently, in the operating system community, there's been a tremendous amount of an explosion of work on this, in part based on, um, on the mock work. Uh, there's a very interesting system called Apertos, a system called Scheduler Activations. All of these are giving clients control over different kinds of mapping decisions. And many of the class libraries that are available in the OO community also have this same kind of property. You can find these systems simply by taking the term mapping dilemma and realizing that what it means is you'll find this kind of problem wherever there's high-level functionality, in other words, there's lots of mapping to do, that needs to be efficient. In other words, the dilemma really is a serious one. Here's another paper I'd like to point you at. Um, this is uh, the paper that introduces the term policy mechanism separation, which is an important term in the OS community. Um, and the very first sentence of the paper is, the extent to which resource allocation policies are entrusted to user-level software determines in large part the degree of flexibility present in an operating system. And that sentence is simply another way of saying clients need control over mapping dilemmas. And this paper goes on to, uh, to continue to argue that point. So what I'd like to do now, what I've done so far is to sort of say we had to control complexity. And we picked an abstraction framework for doing that, which perhaps hid a little too much. Because it turns out that clients often need control over mapping decisions. What I'd like to do now is show you a videotape, which it's in, in its own somewhat perverse way can, I think, A, make us feel better about the situation, and B, give us some perspective on it. Because what it's going to show us is that even a much older and richer discipline than ours has made mistakes with picking abstraction frameworks that hid too much. This tape, it's a tape of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse. This bridge was built in 1940. Um, and at the time this bridge was designed, they explicitly took an abstraction framework, in fact, it was standard practice at the time, which ignored the dynamic properties of structures like this. It's a very interesting decision because they knew that the dynamic properties of steel structures could be important. They had discovered that in smaller structures. Um, but they decided that for purposes of building this bridge, they would be able to ignore that. 
And then one day it kind of got windy in just the wrong way. And as you can see, um, the bridge started to sway a bit too much and eventually ended up falling down. So the lesson there is that even a much older discipline can pick an abstraction framework that doesn't capture all of what matters in certain situations. And I think that can help us understand some of what we need to do uh, to deal with some of, some of these kinds of issues better in the future. So where are we now? We started out by saying we had to control complexity. We tried to do it by hiding the implementation, in particular by using black box abstraction. And we've discovered pretty clearly that we have to let clients control mapping decisions. And in fact, a number of people have been trying to give clients control over mapping decisions in various ways. But now we have a problem. Because the original motivation for hiding the implementation was controlling the complexity of the interface that we present to clients. And if we now need to add more stuff to that interface, in particular we need to add control over mapping decisions, we have a problem because clients' brains didn't magically get any bigger all at once. We got to find a way to control this new additional complexity. And to do that, I think we can borrow another idea from the other engineers, which is this notion that if you can't conquer, you should at least divide, which is exactly the situation we're in. We tried to conquer implementation. We tried to get it right and hide it. It didn't quite work. We now have to expose some of it to clients. But maybe somehow we can achieve simplicity through dividing of interfaces. The thing, though, is that this principle of you can't conquer if you can't conquer, at least divide, all by itself doesn't really say any much more than abstraction. We're left with this question of, well, what should we divide from what and how? And in order to address that problem, I think that we can learn from the community that works on computational reflection, uh, because they have a lot of ideas about this. What computational reflection is, is it's a metaphor for designing systems that have interfaces that need to renegotiate their interfaces. Like object-oriented programming, computational reflection is based on an observation about the world, and it's a claim that we can use that observation as a metaphor for designing these systems. In particular, it's based on this observation that humans in the world renegotiate their contracts, sometimes very explicitly and sometimes less explicitly. So for example, what I've shown in this picture is you have a client and a provider. And the client calls up the provider and says, well, we need 1,000 more widgets. And what's going on is that their day-to-day -day discourse is governed by this contract that specifies what a widget is and how long it takes to build it and how much it costs and other kinds of issues. And most of the time, they have this discussion in terms of that contract about widgets. But what happens is, that every now and then, people need to renegotiate the contract. So what happens is, the client calls up and says, hey, I need to talk about our contract. And when they do that, instead of talking about widgets, they're now talking about the contract. And the reflection community calls that going meta. And it has a bunch of other words, like reify and introspect, that are useful for talking about particular aspects of how that works. I'm not going to go in the, into those today. But one thing that the reflective community has given us is this notion of this, a reflective module, which we can use for thinking about the kinds of systems I've been talking about. Because what they do is they say, well, you should have a normal day-to-day -day discourse, which they call a base interface. And that's just going to provide the normal functionality. And then you should have a separate interface, a meta interface, for adjusting the contract of the normal interface, in particular for adjusting the mapping decisions in the normal interface. And one of the things that the reflection community tells us is that this clear separation between these interfaces is a very important guiding principle. That, in some sense, comes from the basic metaphor that this is an observation about the human world, because all of us know that our friends who go meta all the time are something of a pain, and it would be better if they just did it sometimes. So that's kind of one of the things that drives this base meta separation. So given that notion of a reflective module, 
What I want to do is present a basic design goal for these systems that present clients with control over mapping decisions. What I want to do is say that we're going to replace the notion of hiding the implementation with this new notion of separating control over mapping decisions. Designing these systems well, if we achieve it, what our goal is, is to allow the programmer, on the one hand, to program optimistically in terms of a base interface that just provides functionality, be it the window system or the virtual memory system or the programming language. And then another interface, which as much as possible is separate, that lets them adjust the mapping decisions to, in some sense, tune their base program. So our goal, as the designer of these systems, is to allow our clients to focus their attention alternatively mostly on one program or the other program. So that's our basic design goal, is to let the clients divide their attention in this way. What does this notion of base meta separation do? Let's try to apply it to some of the examples we've seen. If you look at the two programming language examples, I will say that they already have very good base meta separation. In the C case, the declaration that makes a procedure be inline or out of line is very clearly separated from the normal blue or base code. One way of thinking about how well separated it is, is you know, can you cover sort of your red eye versus your blue eye and read, in this case, you can read the blue program, the base program, very clearly while ignoring the red program. And I think that's a good case of, of this base meta separation. It makes it easier for the client to understand what's going on. The same is true of the high performance Fortran declarations. You can clearly read the array declaration without looking at the meta declaration about how it should be distributed. That's another case of good base meta separation. And I won't go into it, but the same holds true for the virtual memory case, because that small program, which I wrote before for changing the paging policy, can really be put very much off to the side of the program that uses virtual memory. Here's a slide which I've borrowed for, from some friends at Taligent, um, in which they're using to talk about their um, client and framework API. Um, it very much has this base meta separation as well. On the one hand, there's an interface, which they call the client API rather than the base API, which just provides the service and the client can build on top of. Then there's the other interface, which they call the framework API rather than the meta API, which allows the client to adjust it. So here's another case of this base meta separation occurring somewhat in nature. Now let's go back to the window system example. Here's a case, the one I showed before, of where I think the base meta separation wasn't so good, and we can use this concept to improve it and to improve the design of the system. Before, we had this function called make lightweight text window. And what had happened was that the meta concern, namely how the mapping dilemma should be resolved, had been confounded with the base concern, namely that this was a text window. In addition to that being generally confusing, there's also this problem of combinatorial e explosion. Because if you have a number of different kinds of meta concern, like it should be lightweight or various other things, and a number of different kinds of base concern, like it should be for text or graphics or color, and you push those into the same namespace, you get this kind of combinatorial explosion problem. And this more principled base meta separation makes that cleaner makes it easier for the client to reason about their program. At this year's Uppsala, there was also a paper by Lortz and Shin, which is also available as part of this video series, which tells us, gives another example of achieving this kind of clean base meta separation. Um, they have a number of examples. The one I've shown here is where they've shown how to get a nice separation between base and meta concerns in a simple data structure library. Here, the class set, which is the base functionality, is clearly separated from client control over the mapping decisions. And they have a nice declarative language for giving the client that kind of control. And that's a very useful paper to look at for, um, for trying to get a better sense of how to work with this concept of base meta separation 
in designing interfaces. Let me talk now. I've presented this basic principle, this basic design goal for these systems that are going to give clients control over uh, mapping decisions. Let me talk now about a few additional design goals. Three of them that I've shown here are incrementality, scope control, and interoperability. What I mean by incrementality is that when a client walks up to your system and uses the base interface to change a mapping decision, they would like to write as little code as possible and do as little work as possible to change that decision. So in the virtual memory case that I showed before, um, the client only had to write about 50 pages of 50 lines of code, I'm sorry, to get a uh, different kind of page replacement policy. That's very good incrementality. In the case of the uh, inline declaration for procedures, also very good incrementality. That's a very important property for this to work. Another very important property is scope control. What that means is that if the client walks up and uses the meta interface to change some mapping decision, they want to be able to bound the scope of the effect of the new mapping decision. So for example, if you change the way arrays are laid out, you would like to be able to say that this particular array is laid out in some different way, rather than all of the arrays. So scope control, again, is a very important property if we're going to let clients reach in and control mapping decisions. Interoperability is a property I won't say as much about, but basically it means that if you change, for example, the mapping decision for one array, that should not, that should, it should still be possible to use that array in a program that normally uses other kinds of arrays. I don't want to say too much about how to achieve these properties, but one very useful set of technologies is the technologies of object-oriented programming. And there's a great deal of debate about what object-oriented programming, what the essence of it is, and what it means, and all of that. And I'm certainly not going to get into that here. But object-oriented programming, whatever it is, I've drawn it as polymorphism and delegation and inheritance, is often used in these kinds of base meta systems to achieve these properties. I'll just go through that quickly. You can use OO to achieve incrementality. This is another picture which comes from the frameworks people. Um, OO is used to break up the internal modularity of the system so that if you want to change one component, maybe one of these boxes would be the component that is the page replacement policy. You can just replace that. So you use OO to get an internal module structure that allows customization. OO can also be used uh, to achieve scope control, turning to this picture, which is again about the virtual memory case. In those systems, they got scope control by using object-oriented programming to get a kind of Cartesian coordinate. Because what happens is, here I've drawn the vertical axes as individual regions of memory, and the horizontal axes as individual operations on those regions. And so what object-oriented programming did was it let the designers of those systems allow clients to say, look, for one particular region of memory, I want to change the page to flush operation. And it shouldn't affect anything else. So that's how object-oriented programming played there. And again, I'm not going to go into much more detail about that. I do want to introduce one particular combination of both base meta separation and object-oriented programming, which is this concept of a meta-object protocol. I won't talk about it much in detail, but what a meta-object protocol is, it's a system which is giving clients control over internal aspects of the system with a principled base meta separation, and it's using object-oriented programming to achieve these properties of scope control and incrementality and interoperability. So when you see the term meta-object protocol, what it is is it's a specific technology for providing the, client, the kinds of access that I've been talking about in this talk. Let me quickly mention one final design goal for these kinds of systems, uh, which is efficiency. This is important because the original motivation for this talk was to say that in order to achieve better efficiency, we need to give clients control over mapping decisions. But what I've been saying all along is the way we're going to do that is to give clients control over the internal working of the system. And 
we need to be careful that giving them that control doesn't cost us more efficiency than it gains. To think about that, let me make the observation that the game we're playing here is a game that's all about binding time. The later you make a decision, the more information is known and the more the client is in the picture. So in some sense, you can make a mapping decision which better suits the specific needs of the client at that particular moment. You can make, in some sense, a better decision. That's the argument so far. On the other hand, the traditional approach has been to make the mapping decisions very early. Because the earlier you make them, the easier it is to recover the actual overhead of decision making. And this fundamental tension has been kind of the source of much of the problem. The observation I want to make is that this period of time between compile and runtime, which we've traditionally thought about as being very quantized, can actually be thought of as more of a spectrum. And what's going on in particular is that a number of people have noticed that there isn't just such a thing as runtime. But for any critical operation, you're actually going to run it a number of times. So maybe you can defer some of the work until the first runtime for later runtimes. And there's been a bunch of work on advanced compiler techniques that make it possible to generate the code that you need at the last minute, not until it's needed. And as a result, it can be highly customized. In other words, that's where the client's going to get in and make the mapping decision. And there's this kind of triad of techniques, partial evaluation, runtime code generation, and lazy evaluation, that can be used to achieve that. There's been a bunch of work on this in, in earlier small talk implementations, in earlier self implementations. One paper I want to point you at, it's a little known paper. Um, it's from um, SOSP 89. It's by uh, Henry Maslin and Kelton Pooh. Um, and what this paper basically shows is it introduces a technique that they call incremental specialization. And what they're doing is constantly recompiling the operating system, in particular, recompiling the file system to take advantage of more information that's been come known and constantly tuning um, the file system implementation to suit that particular program and that particular file and that particular moment in time. And while this doesn't have a meta interface per se, this technology can be used to get efficient meta interfaces because it allows very late binding of mapping decisions. So let me summarize again the argument so far. Again, the first point is we are engineers. As engineers, we have to control complexity. We tried to do it with black box abstraction, which was based on saying that we'd hide the implementation. That doesn't always work because the mapping decisions show through, and that results in hematomas encoding between the lines. So one way or another, clients have to get control over mapping decisions. And in fact, what we saw is that there were a bunch of systems which despite the fact that our explicit rhetoric about design says that you should hide implementation, we're actually exposing various kinds of implementation. And what I did was to give some words for talking about what they were exposing, mapping decisions. And then I said, well, if you're going to give clients control over this stuff, you still need to control complexity. And I said that separation of control was a crucial aspect there, this if you can't conquer, you should at least divide principle. And I talked about some other principles like scope control and incrementality that are very important to getting that right. And I said that we could look at work on computational reflection and object-oriented programming and compiler techniques. And in particular, we can look at a lot of case studies. Use this analysis and those case studies to learn more about how to design better systems that are going to give clients the kind of meta control that they need. Let me say something about the value of this kind of analysis. In fact, the value of any abstraction framework that captures the properties of the systems we need to build. Because there's no technology here. Right? There's not a specific programming language that you can use. What this analysis does it, is it lets us talk about these kinds of problems in a clearer way. 
we can say things like, right here in my system, this hematoma comes from a mapping conflict with this particular decision that the implementer made. It will let us call up our favorite vendor, or if they're not our favorite vendor, they may at least just be the vendor that we have to use. We could call them up and say, look, I need control over this mapping decision. When vendors propose to us to give us a certain kind of control, we can ask questions like, well, how good is the base meta separation here? That's that question about how easy is it for you to think about the functionality separate from the control over the mapping decision? How fine grain is the scope control? How good is the incrementality? All of these kinds of concepts are going to help us think about both the design and use of systems that are providing us with the meta control we need. Now, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of work left to do here. What I've tried to do is to lay out the basic structure of a new abstraction framework, a new way of thinking about these kinds of problems and these kinds of systems. I'm not going to say much about all the work that remains to be done, but let me just sketch a couple things. One issue is how do we identify the mapping dilemma? When you're done watching this tape and you go out and you design a module for someone else to use, you need to be able to say to yourself, well, what are the mapping dilemmas that I should provide a meta interface to control? And I think we're going to have to learn a methodology for doing that. We don't have one yet. I do know it's going to be highly iterative. I think the techniques of participatory design can help. But that's one open area of work. Another open area of work is specification. How are we going to document meta interfaces? How are we going to deal with giving clients control over internal implementation issues in a way that they can understand? Verification is another issue. If clients are going to be able to reach inside and change something, we have to be able to test the systems. Another issue has to do with what I want to call functionality dilemmas. This talk so far has motivated giving clients meta control over the systems that we provide them based entirely on a performance argument. What I've done is to say that clients need access to mapping decisions. But one of the things that we learned on the CLOS MetaObject protocol is that even for substrate software like programming languages and operating systems, sometimes clients want to reach inside and change the actual behavior or semantics of the system in addition to changing the mapping decisions. And one thing we need to do is reconstruct the conceptual argument in this talk for that case. And there's a lot of people working on that. So these are just some of the additional things we need to do. So what I've been talking about is a new set of words and way of understanding some old problems that are going to help us build a kind of system that's becoming increasingly important today. I'm talking about where we're going in the next few years here. But let me just take a second now for fun to look a little farther in the future than that and think for a minute about what's really going on. We started out by trying to take an abstraction mechanism that hit implementation and then that didn't work because implementation showed through. And the truth of the matter is we never should have been surprised about that. We knew from the beginning that those interfaces were just partial descriptions of what was going on. We designed them to be partial descriptions of what's going on because what's really going on is much too complicated for us to cope with. You know, inside the machine, the disks are spinning and the disk heads are going back and forth and the electrons are whirring around and all sorts of stuff is going on. So those interfaces and those simple programs were just partial abstract descriptions of what was going on. And the same is actually true in any engineering discipline. Suppose that I want to build the following very simple structure. So here it is. It's a little wooden bridge. Now that seems simple enough, but it's actually an extraordinarily complex system. I can draw one picture, like this one here, that captures some aspects of this situation. But there's a great deal more going on than that. 
there's shear forces and creep and quantum mechanics and stability issues and aesthetic integrity and corrosion resistance. And there's just a whole bunch of issues that are important issues about the design of this structure. What the other engineering disciplines do is they deal with this problem that any single description can't capture the true complexity of the system by having multiple descriptions that capture the different kinds of complexity. So they may have some descriptions that capture more or less detail, like these two. And that's something we've been good at in software. Our layers of abstraction, in some sense, are capturing more or less detail about the situation. But then they have other kinds of abstract descriptions that capture other different issues entirely. And that's what this picture is. is it's capturing a completely different aspect of this situation. It's capturing the dynamic properties of this little bridge. These kinds of pictures to capture dynamic properties in bridges were introduced after the splish splash that we saw before. What the other engineering disciplines do is in addition to having technologies for capturing these different kinds of issues, they also have elaborate social conventions for coordinating among these different issues. So the nice thing that they've had is they've been able to capture different aspects of the situation using different kinds of pictures. Returning to software for a minute, we have a very similar situation. We have abstract descriptions like this program which gloss over many of the issues. They capture some of what's important. They hide a bunch of other issues. But our abstract descriptions have this other wonderful property that the other engineers never had, which is they can be automatically run, whatever run means. They can be automatically run to produce the entire behavior we're after. So even though the description's partial, we already know about all the different kinds of important things that this little blue program doesn't say, I can nonetheless run it and get the whole behavior. And that's because the substrate implementation fills in the missing pieces. So the question, of course, you can see where I'm going, is what would it mean to have the best of our style of engineering and their style of engineering both? Well, it would mean that we would need to have abstract descriptions that captured some of the crucial aspects of the situation while hiding the rest of the complexity. We've both had that in the past. It would mean that we would need to have multiple descriptions that capture different aspects of the situation. That's something that the other engineers have had, but we haven't had. And finally, it would mean that these abstract descriptions would need to be automatically combined and executed to produce the total behavior. Because that's the wonderful, sexy thing that we've had in software that the other engineers haven't had. Now, how are you going to get both of these second things? Well, somehow, you need to come up with different descriptions that work very hard not to say things in one description so it can later be filled in in another description. So we need multiple automatically combined and executed descriptions. This is a very long-term goal. I think we're quite a ways from that in the general case. But I think the kind of systems we've seen today with these base and meta interfaces and this abstraction framework that I presented today is a step in that direction. Because if you look at these systems, what you see is they present two abstract interfaces that let clients write two abstract programs. Each of the programs captures different issues. Each of the programs captures an abstraction of the issues. And they get automatically combined to produce the resulting behavior. So this is a step towards that long-term dream of having the best of both kinds of engineering. Thank you very much.